I am actually standing and preaching, and it has been an entry, a very interesting week for me. On Monday, I departed to go to Louisiana. I received a phone call that one of my battle buddies from the military has been arrested, and I needed to go take care of him. So Monday I departed, I got into the hospital and they did not let me see him. I said, Lord, I didn't come all the way out here not to lay hands on my buddy. Tuesday passed, making some phone calls, praying. Tuesday night, I get a text from one of the social workers at the VA. He said, I just talked to the social worker. They don't do this often, or they don't do it at all. He was actually involuntarily committed to the hospital, because now he was in suicide watch. For those of you who know me, understand that I have lost seven of my soldiers through suicide. My wife and I made a commitment that we will not actually lose another one. So I got this text at like 10.30 at night. And it said, you have been allowed to see your friend face to face tomorrow. And I told you I was going to make a call. I told you last Sabbath I was going to make a call. See, we started this basic training series talking about Sodom. And someone mentioned this. Fires, tornadoes in Rhode Island, hurricanes, now rain in Southern California, in the actual desert. I was stationed there for three years. We talked about Sodom, about how this world looks just like Sodom, and how Sodom is actually showing us that Jesus is just around the corner. Last week, I introduced you to this manual for salvation, but I, um, I felt the need, and I actually have some text about explanations about some things that I mentioned last week. So what I did was I wrote my sermon on Tuesday evening because this is the words that I told my friend. So I entitled my sermon today, The Manual for Salvation, Part 2. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is your moment. Speak to us. In Christ's name, amen. So I talked to my friend, and I actually started reviewing what we actually discussed last Sabbath. And there's two questions that we want to deal with this morning, all right? How do you become a Christian? And once you become a Christian, how do you maintain yourself or keep yourself and stay a Christian, all right? How do you get religion, and how do you keep it? That's pretty much it. Last week I said that all of us, every single one of us that is born of a woman is a sinner. We are born in sin. Amen? Okay. I'm glad that, you know, <laughs> you know, but I also gave you the other sign of the coin. All, all of you have, all you have to do to become a saint is to be born again. God has made a provision for that. And friends, a Christian, a real Christian has by grace a spiritual nature, but that spiritual nature does not produce babies. Human nature produces babies. Are you following me? And the problem in this world today is that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And too few 
in the world today have tried to avail themselves of the help that they so desperately need, which is freely there through Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, let me put it this way. The problem in the world today is not a problem of wars or a problem of crime. The problem in the world today is a problem of sin. And bigger yet, most people have only been born once. And the only solution to this dilemma of sin is to be born again. Amen? Amen. Now, when a person surrenders to Christ and is born again, that person becomes a new creature. And as a new creature, that person it has a power that comes from the outside of himself, and it is called the Holy Spirit. And that power comes into the life and resides in their life and gives them victory. Amen? Amen. Now, victory means that they don't do what they used to do. And until that happens, we cannot change human nature. Now, here's the question that we got, that, you know, that we got this past week regarding, uh, you know, last week's sermon. This is, the, this is the actual question that people ask me. Mario... How are you born again? So let's expand on last week's sermon. And now I'm going to talk to Maggie and my friend who is watching right now, by the way. I'll tell you all about her during the call. You see, people is still bent in doing something to be saved. And the business of taking a sinner and changing them into a saint is the work of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, by the merits of Christ in Calvary, and through his resurrection on Easter Sunday. Amen? Amen? Now, how can you say something like that, Mario? Very simple. Let's review. Romans 2, 4, it says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Last week, I only showed you two steps to conversion. In fact, there are three. Repentance, confession, and then conversion, meaning the acceptance of the grace of God. The first one is repentance. Let's review. It says this. Repentance, we said last week, is the sorrow for sin. It is becoming disgusted with the rebellious life, but it's not only that. It is also turning away from sin. You see, you have not repented until you are ready to stop doing what you're doing. I'll say amen for you. Amen. Now, if repentance is one thing to do right and giving up wrong, then I just told you that it is the goodness of God that leads you to do that. You know, there are people that come to me who believe that, that they have gone too far. And they say, Mario, I want to be a Christian, but I don't believe that I can be saved. And I said to them, you, you, what did you say? You want to be a Christian? Oh, yes, I do, Pastor. It, you know, you cannot even want to be a Christian without God. Because it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. Let me give you another example. Philippians 2.13, I'm just reviewing. It says, the Bible says that, for it is God. Who? God. God who works in you to both what? Will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen? And I, I just want to put it in simple language. It is God that works inside of you to will, to want to do right, and to do, to perform the works of righteousness. If you, want to, if you find a person who wants to do right, it is God in that person making them will to do right. If you find somebody that working cautiously and living a good life, a good Christian life, it is God inside of them through the presence of the Holy Spirit that gives them the power to live above sin. We have nothing to do, you know, we have nothing to boast about. Folks, if God turned his head, all of us would do what everybody else is doing. Let me give you another example. John 6, 44. It says clearly, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me does what? Draws them. 
So those impulses to come to the movement, even though you thought that you were supporting a baby dedication or a baptism, no, no, no. That desire to come here and listen to the word of the Lord is it, it, the Holy Spirit working with you, and you ought to thank God that he is dealing with you. You have nothing to do with it. But it is because of his desperate love for sinners. You see, he hates sin, but thank God he loves sinners. And it is his Holy Spirit wooing us and speaking to us and playing upon the, the heartstrings, uh, our heartstrings that causes us to desire to do the will of our God. That's repentance, when you're ready to quit. Now we mentioned that any religion that offers forgiveness without victory is worse than no religion at all. See, I'm glad that the religion of Christ not only pardons me, but it causes me to walk straight in the future. I'm glad that he not only forgives my sin, but he gives me victory over that sin if I want it. You see, you can live right by the power of God. You, you cannot live right by willpower. You cannot live right by self-determination. You cannot live right by pulling yourself by your bootstraps. You cannot live right by behavior modification, but you can live right by the Holy Spirit. Now, you don't have to do what the devil wants you to do. See, nobody said amen. I don't understand that. I don't, I don't get it. You, you don't have to be a slave of the devil. You know why? Because there is victory in Christ and there is power in the blood. See, I'm tired of people thinking that they cannot live right. Oh, yes, you can. You can treat your wife right. Oh, yes, you can. No man said amen. You, you, you can give up your dirty thoughts. Oh, yes, you can. Don't tell me you cannot stop drinking and smoking and carousing. Oh, yes, you can. And if you don't, it's because you don't want to. Now, having felt that you want to live a good life, the second step is confession. What word did I say? Confession. And confession, well, Mario, what is that? Well, confession is getting on your knees in private and telling Jesus about your dirt and asking him to forgive you and to give you power in your life to live above sin and to say goodbye to sin. And we said last week that real repentance is a U-turn in the road of life. You were going to the road you know, pointing to hell, now you're making a U-turn and you're going the opposite way. Now, it does not mean that you won't make a mistake now and then. But it means that you are now committed towards heaven. And, you know, I have come you know, to the conclusion that, you know, um, you need to get down and talk to God. By the way, who is your friend? And that's what I told my friend. Let me introduce you to a friend. Let me tell you about him this morning. See, it's a pleasure for me in to, to introduce you to Jesus. And, and I introduce him to everybody, almost anybody, just almost every day. You see, he didn't come all the way here to, because he did not love people. Jesus did not come here to condemn either. Some of us think that Christ is a policeman or a sheriff or something who is just watching to see, you know, to catch you doing something wrong so that he can condemn you. Friends, if he only wanted to condemn, condemn us, he doesn't have to do anything because we are born condemned. So the Lord is not trying to see how many people he can actually punish. No, he's trying to see how many people he can save. See, the Lord is not interested in how many people he can send to hell. He's interested in trying to save as many people who are willing into heaven. So you got to think about Jesus as a friend. And when you get on your knees, you can talk to him. And you know one thing that I love about Jesus? When you tell him something, right, he doesn't put your business on the street. You see, the Bible says in Matthew 6, 4, your father who he actually sees in secret will, will he himself reward you in openly. So, so sometimes when, when you talk about Jesus, young people, I, I love my young people, you know, when I go to universities to speak, they're like, as Mario, is it true that God knows and hears everything that, yes, yes it is. Ah, then if he already knows, 
what I have done, why do I have to confess? Why tell him if he already knows? And that's a good question, right? Okay, never mind. I thought it was a good question. And I learned a great answer from one of my mentors. You have mis- if you have mistreated somebody somewhere, and you know you have, when you have done something wrong, it may be your husband or your wife or your child or your parents or your neighbor or your friend, but when you have done something wrong, you know it and they know it, right? Everybody here is a saint, Lord. Everybody here got it straight. No. See, every time you're around that person, right, who you have wrong, you feel awful. And you swell up. And if you're eating, your, 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 your appetite goes away. You cannot even talk. And if you have mistreated your wife, you cannot even call her baby. Husbands, keep looking straight. You see, it is rough when you have mistreated someone. And if you have a good sense and you get tired of this nonsense and you make up your mind, you know what? I'm just going to apologize. Now, the minute you begin to apologize, you start feeling better, right? And you start feeling humble too. And when you approach that person that you, you, you have wrong, your head is always down. That's, that's humility. And you say to the person, you know, uh, you cannot even look at them in the eyes. You know I mistreated you. Are you telling that person something that he or she does not know? If anybody knows, it's he or she, right? Then why tell them? And that's the same question that people ask me about God. If the person already knows, why tell them? If God already knows, why tell them? Because confession is not informing God. Confession is a way, is God's way for you to get rid of your load of your, the load of your sins. Confession is like an apology. You're getting it off your chest. Confession is like an apology. You're clearing the air between yourself and an offended God. Confession is not informing God. It's letting God know that you acknowledge your condition and you come to the only one who can help you. And you're willing to accept his terms. And you want to be his friend. And you want to be forgiven. That's why you confess. If you're a liar, just tell them you're a liar. If you're an adulterer, just tell them I'm an adulterer. Whatever your problem is or has been, you can talk to God frankly about it. But talk to God knowing that his only interest in you is to take your sins away and take you into his kingdom. Talk to him knowing that he who has made you want to, you know, hey, he is the one that made you want to talk about it. He's already reached out to you, and he has overshadowed you, with, uh, you know, with, with an aura of his heavenly presence. Talk to him in that atmosphere, and don't be afraid to tell him anything. Some of you may be asking, but Mario, how do I know that God hurt me? The, folks, I'm just giving you the questions that people threw at me during the week. Well, definitely he's not going to call you and say, hey, Mario, this is God. I'm just letting you know that I heard you. He's not going to write you an email. Don't wait for the text. All right? How do you know? The word is faith. What word did I say? Yeah, yeah. And this is, this is, where, we get, this is where we get twisted. Romans 10, 17. Write it down. It says this. It says, hey, faith comes by hearing. I'm hearing by what? The word of God. So you have to have faith in the right things. Faith in the word of God. Not in the word of a preacher. First John 1 John 1.9, my favorite text in the whole Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from some. From what? How many? All unrighteousness. Don't you love that? Proverbs 28.13, it says it clearly, he who covers sins will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will have what? See, you see, you got to confess. But then you have to what? Say, I'm not going to do it again. You know these games that we play, right? I'm just going to confess and tell God, and then I'm just going to do it again. No, no, no. See, I can go on reading the Bible, text after text, 
But the Bible is clear. And you know what? The Bible says that God cannot lie. The Bible says that it is impossible for God to lie. In fact, yes, Numbers 23, 19 says that he's not a man that he should lie. Now, if it is impossible for God to lie, and if he cannot lie, when he has spoken to you out of his word, you got to have faith in the word. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. See, those who come unto God must first believe that he is and that he, he, he is the reward of them that diligently seeks him. James 1.5, it says this, if any of you like wisdom, like me, I'm dumb, let him ask of God who gives to all what? Liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. But watch this now, but let him ask in faith. With no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Did you get that? If you pray and you don't pray in faith, God is not going to answer that prayer. The Bible says, ask in faith. And faith is knowing that God sits on the throne. You know why? Because he said he is. Faith is knowing that God hears your prayer because he says he does. Faith is knowing that God is able to answer your prayer. You know why? Because he said he can. And when you pray like that, all you have to do is, is get that answer appropriated to, to yourself by faith. What do you say? Now, just if someone, it's like someone holding a, a bunch of money and says, go ahead, Mario, take it. He's not going to push it to you. He's not going to shove it down your throat. But I can reach and grab it and it's mine. God says with your faith, it is done. When Jesus healed the sick, the leper, he said, he said not his faith, he said your faith has made you whole. It, you know, it, folks, this is what we have to have. Some of you are saying right now, are you saying, Mario, that, that your mother that died from cancer did not have enough faith? That's not what I'm saying. But God's will is perfect, and this world is not. There are things that we cannot understand. Then why did he heal the leper, and he did not heal your mother? You, have you ever thought that the very sickness that he, with pain, allowed my mother to go through was the only way to save her life? I had to pray about it. I had to fast over it. Don't let the devil fool you into your misery. Sickness came into this world because of the devil. Remember that. Now, God says, if you confess your sins, I'll forgive you. And then the minute you do your part, believe the word of God, it is done. I heard people tell me, Mario, I just cannot help it. I, I, this is just the way that I am. I don't believe anything I don't see. That's not true. And if you feel that way, I won't be advertising it either. We are creatures of faith. The reason why is because we are creatures of limitations. Uh, none of you believe me. Okay, watch. We don't even know what the next minute is going to bring, do we? We live by faith. You got to this church this morning by faith. You sat in those pews by faith. You didn't know if these pews would actually collapse or break your back by sitting on them. Look above you. You see all that stuff? Huh? They can come trumbling down on your head and kill you. But you actually got here by faith because you said, you know what? They must have built it right. You didn't see it built, but you're here. You go home. Man, you go home and you eat dinner. How do you know that your wife did not get mad at you and put poison in your food? <laughs> keep looking straight. Keep looking straight. I get on a plane all the time, fly 1,200. I, I, I allow that pilot to, you know, to fly that plane by faith. You see, but when it comes to trusting God, 
some people think that it's smart to question. You see, I'm not so much interested in those who won't believe. I am interested in those who will believe. And the Lord is working in the hearts of people right now. And I believe that with all my heart that you believe in God. If you do, say amen. amen. Then believe all the way. Let yourself go with God. Stop holding back. Confess your sins and he will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And when that happens, you believe that it had happened. Believe it that it's yours. Believe that you belong to the family and it is so. And that way, boom, God claims you right there and then. You become a Christian. But what you have not, you actually realize that you have not changed as much as you thought you were going to change. And, and, and friends, I want to be as clear as I possibly can. There are more people you, that you can imagine that are looking for certain feeling as evidence of conversion. You read it in the Bible all the way through. 66 books. By faith, not by feeling. Now, feelings are related to emotions. When my mother died, my sister cried more than I did. Does that mean that my sister loved my mother more? No, sir. It just happens that she could actually have been more emotional than I was. You see, there is nothing wrong with emotions. But what I'm saying is that you ought to keep the cart before the horse and not get feelings mixed up with faith. You are saved by faith. Say it. I am saved by faith. The Bible says that over and over and over again. But there are people waiting for some kind of electric shock to go up and down their spine before they believe. Some are looking for a sign or a wonder. Haven't you heard the scriptures when Thomas uh, said, I'm not going to believe it until I put my finger in the sore of his hand? Jesus presented himself and said, Thomas, go ahead. And when Thomas saw that it was the Lord, he said, my Lord and my God. And Christ said, Thomas, you have seen and finally believed. But blessed are those who believe without seeing. Amen? Amen. So we got to have faith to believe what God says. And when we believe, it is done. We become Christians. You are saved. But you are not angels. How does the Lord take care of your past sins? Now, here's what I, I did not actually explain last week, and I need to do so for the sake of my friend and for the sake of Maggie, all right, and for the sake of mercy. See, there are some terms in the Bible that we associate with big theology. Friends, you need to understand that everything, and, you know, my fellow, you know, he's going to become an alumni. I'm a WAU alumni, so whenever you need a feel, come here. We'll take care of you. You see... You need to understand that everything that God put in this word, he puts it here for ordinary folk who believe in him. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Nothing is so complicated. You know who makes it complicated? Theologians. Some folks lose their faith trying to explain things. But for those who want to be saved or to serve God, everything is here for you. Now, the words that I mentioned last week that people actually texted me about, these words are justification and sanctification. Say those with me. What does the word mean? Justification is the business of justifying. It's making one just or taking away one's guilt. You got that? If that's clear, say amen. amen. Now, sanctification from the Latin sanctus means holy. Is making one holy, making one just or without sin. Sanctification is making one holy. So, one of them takes care of man's past sins. The other one is keeping man in the future and making him holy, holy, holy. Now, the Apostle Paul, the great theologian, used two terms that are associated with these two words. They are Imputed righteousness, say that with me. And the other one is imparted righteousness, say that with me. Now you say, Mario, man, that's deep. It is, but it's also simple. And I want to tell you, how, I want to show you how simple it is. I've already explained to you that justification is taking away one's past sins and making him or her just. 
Sanctification is keeping one in the path of righteousness so that one becomes holy. Got it? All right. Now, how does God justify and take away the past sins? He does it through imputed righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. How does God sanctify a person? He does it by imparted righteousness. But Mario, what do those two words mean? Watch me now because this is simple. Impute means to give credit for. Say that. Impute means what? Impart means to share as needed. <laughs> Come on, say that again. Share as? Now watch how simple it is. Here's the person who has sinned for a long, long time. He comes to God and he says, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. The Lord says, I'll do it. I'll take away your sins. But, but God, God is not only a merciful God, he's also a just God. He has to keep the books balanced. Otherwise, other beings would accuse him of being partial. So you just cannot have all 20 years of sin just taken away and then leave 20 years of clean pages. You got to have something in the books. So the Lord says, okay, I'm going to take away 20 years of lying and I'm going to give you credit for 20 years of my son's truthfulness. You've been fooling around for the past 20 years, but I'm going to wash it away. I, and in place of that, I'm going, to put, I'm going to put the purity of my son Jesus' life. I'm giving you credit for the life. Okay, okay, go, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's review something that I mentioned last week to make it even more simple. On the cross, God looked at his only begotten son who was dying. There were two thieves there. Finally, one of those thieves looking through his dim eyes saw the place of the dead, the place where his own body was going to be thrown and burned in the city dump of Jerusalem. And suddenly it could have been that his consciousness became aware of the fact that after all his riotous life, he was headed to the heap trash of Jerusalem. And the desperation of his soul made him look around. And he looked for, around for a, 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 he saw a mob. He saw the frightened disciples. They were travelers and none of them could help him. So he looked towards the cross in the middle. And when he, he did, his eyes fell on God. And he saw Jesus Christ in his purity. And he saw Jesus Christ in his honesty and in his innocence. And he looked at Christ. It, it could have been that he remembered something that he had been taught as a child. From the Old Testament book of Isaiah, that the Son of God will come. His name will be Emmanuel. And that he will be bruised for our iniquities. He will be chast and the chastisements of our peace will be upon him. And as the thief began to think in his desperate time, he began to put it all together and his faith sprung up. And he said, this must be the Lord. And the thief turned to that cross in the middle. And he cried out, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You see, we, you know, we said last week that the thief called Jesus Lord. Now, everybody I, I, likes the Savior part. They just don't like the Lord part. Because a Lord is someone who tells you what to do, and you do it. A Lord is someone who, are, who, who you allow to take charge of your life. A Lord is someone who gives you commandments and orders, and you obey them. When that thief looked at Jesus, he didn't say, Savior. He said, Lord, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to turn my life over to you. I'm, I will take, you know, take over my life, and, but remember me when you come into your kingdom. Oh, Jesus, stop dying. To hear a sinner's prayer. And Jesus turned to, that, to him immediately and said, I am telling you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Jesus did not say, how much money did you put in church? Jesus did not say, how many Sabbaths have you kept? Jesus did not say, how many sick people did you visit? Jesus did not say, have you been praying lately? Oh, Jesus did not say any, any of that. He said, I'm telling you today, you're going to be with me in heaven. But wait a minute, we have a problem. In Acts 2.38, it says, except a man repents and is baptized, he cannot be in heaven. Now, that thief repented, but he did not get baptized. Huh. He's on the cross, and yet Jesus said, I'm going to save you. Is Christ violating his own word? 
Let's go back to the day that Jesus was baptized. He was walking down the river Jordan. John the Baptist had been preaching. I have been sent as a forerunner of the Messiah. One day John looked up through the crowd and saw Jesus coming. And he said to the crowd, behold, that means look up yonder. Here it comes, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus walked into the river and he asked John to baptize him. And John said, Lord, Lord, I'm not worthy. You, 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 you don't need baptizing. I need to be baptized of you. My friends, that was true. Because baptism, here comes Maggie. Baptism represents a burial of sin and rising to walk in a new life. See, Christ had never sinned. He didn't need baptism. But Jesus said, John, suffer be so. In other words, force yourself to do it anyhow that I might fulfill righteousness. Three and a half years later, he was on the cross and a thief cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus would have said, well, I would if you could be baptized. No, no, no. Jesus did not say any of that. He said, I'm going to save you. But what about baptism? I'm going to give you credit for my baptism. Oh, that's why we call it amazing grace. Christ justifies you and gives you credit for his life. That's imputed righteousness to give credit for. And in that way, he has earned the right through his sacrifice to take away our sins, to take away our guilt, to take away all of our dirt that you have ever done. Blessed be the Lord. And when that happens, you are his child. You are saved. But where people get thrown off is that they discover that they still human. And I need you to hear me. Because this is where my friend got problems. Where I got problems. See, when I first came to the Lord, I had a great experience. I said to myself, I had given my life to you, Jesus. And then I went home, and before the day was done, I had lost my temper. Some people, before the day is over, start calling their wives' names. And then the devil gets on your shoulder and starts saying, I guess your experience means nothing. And people start saying, I guess, I guess it, wasn't, it wasn't real, and they backslide. And that happens all the time. The challenge is now, how do you remain a Christian? Well, I'm going to encourage you from the book of Romans chapter 7, and I'm going to begin in verse 18. What did I say? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, the Bible speaks, and you know who wrote Romans, right? Paul. Now, Paul, when he wrote Romans, he had been a preacher for a long, long time. He was a saint. He had been converted, had lived for Christ for a long time. And this is what he wrote in Romans 7 and verse 18. He said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, Nothing good dwells. What? This is Paul, a saint, and yet he's saying, In my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. What? And then he says, For the good that I will to do, I don't do. But the evil that I will, I will not to do, that I practice. Not if I do what I will not to do, what is wrong with me? And then he says in verse 23, but I see another law in my members, worrying against the law of my mind. And they bring me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now Paul is talking, he's saying, hey, my flesh is it's no good. Why? Because you're born in sin. Through Adam, sin was planted in your flesh. Well, how then do you accept the Lord? With your mind. Paul says, now my mind wants to do right, but my flesh wants, makes mistakes. My mind wants to be clean and pure, but my flesh wants to read the wrong kinds of things. Huh? They want to see the wrong things on television. They want to look at the wrong things on the internet. There's a conflict going on inside of me. Do you understand what I'm talking about here, folks? Are you following me? 
Paul is saying, said, I have a problem. That, that, it, then he carried out and said, oh, wretched man, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Who can help me with this problem? He answered his own question in the last verse, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he says in Romans 1, 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, I want you to get this because many people give their hearts to the Lord and, and they get discouraged and turn around simply because they're sorry to discover that they're not angels. You're not an angel. You're not divine. Don't look in the mirror for a halo over your head. You are still you. But you got to grow in grace. You got to have some time and some experience. You got to do some praying. You got to do some believing. And you got to be tested along the way, just like in school. And as you grow, you get stronger and stronger. And you overcome more and more. Friends, I don't know anybody who has overcome every temptation. Are you listening? Because the sin, there's sin in the flesh. Well, Lord, what can you do? I'm going to forgive your past by imputed righteousness, by imputing righteousness. And I'm going to give you credit for my life and take away your sin. But Lord, that takes care of the past. Who's going to keep me in the future? Oh, I can handle that too. How, Lord? To impart righteousness. How are you going to do that? I'm going to give it to you as you need it. I'm not going to give it all to you all at once. If I did that, you stop praying. If I gave it all to you all at once, you would criticize everybody else like those hypocrites in the church. If I give it all to you, you would not be patient with those sinners who are struggling. If I give it all to you, you would just gossip about everybody who made a mistake. So I'm going to give it to you as you need it. Not much, just what you need so you can stay humble. Lord, how do I get it? Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. I will impart righteousness as you need it. Well, what would that do for me? That will sanctify you. What does that mean? It will make you holy. You mean holy here in Jamartown, Maryland? I can be holy? Yes, sir. How? Through the imparted righteousness. And the beauty about this is that it's not just for me and a, and, a, and a selective few. It's for whosoever will. The most rotten sinner here and at home this morning can have it. He's anxious to give it. He loves to save man and woman. And the worse you are, the more he's glorified when he saves you. He loves saving people. He begins the process and he ends the process. That's why Paul says in Hebrews 12 too, he is the author and finisher of your faith. Now, you need the Lord as soon as you wake up. Hear me now. Hear me because I know how you are. You, oh, I get up late. Whoop, got to go. You, you need the Lord. The minute you open your eyes, you need the Lord. Why? Because you got a problem. In fact, Jesus says that you have a problem. He said in Matthew 26 and verse 41, watch and pray. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is what? Pray without ceasing for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because the flesh is weak. The flesh is what? How many of you have flesh? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You see, Jesus said the flesh is weak. And if you want the remedy, the remedy is pray. You see, I have, I have sin in the flesh, but my mind wants to do right. If, you, if I get in my car, right, and I hit a station that I should not be listening to, you know, my reggaeton, you know, station. I, hey, I grew up with that stuff, all right? So, you know, I hit it. Oh, that sounds good, right? The flesh takes over. You know what I'm talking about? The young people know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so, so I didn't intend to do it. You, you don't have to intend the flame sins automatically. Isn't that right? Now, I'm in trouble. But what can you do when you're in trouble? What can you do? Pray. What kind of prayer should I pray? 
a desperate cry to hell because you're in trouble. Well, Mario, should I go back to the night, right next to my bed and kneel down? No, you're in trouble in your car. Pray there. Should I close my eyes? Sure. If you want to crash. <laughs> you know, folks, I'm trying to be practical. Folks, prayer is a cry of the soul in need. It's the unspoken appeal of the heart. I prayed one day and I wasn't even in the church. I was in downtown Ramadi, Iraq, and I was getting shot at. And there were too many of them, too few of us. And believe me, I was running. My eyes were open saying, Lord, please get me out of this place. Never did I pray such a prayer that, oh, like that day. And the Lord answered that prayer. Are you listening to me? You see, oh, Mario, how long should, how long should the prayer be? My brother Peter one day was sinking. And the Bible says that Peter cried out, Lord, save me. Three words. If Peter tried to pray this long prayer that some of these pretenders pray, Peter would have drowned before he said amen. <laughs> Folks, again, I'm just trying to be practical. So when you're in trouble, all you have to do is cry out, Lord, help me. So I'm going to give you a tip that it was given to me a long time ago. I'm almost done. I'm hungry. You cannot pray and sin at the same time. I dare you to try it. Go, go, go ahead. The minute you grab something, oh, hey, hey, pray. Go ahead and say a prayer to see if you can do it. So the minute you're in trouble with the flesh, cry out, Lord, help me. Save me. Help me. And now the prayer without faith is what? Dead. And a faith without work is what? Dead. So when you pray, you have to believe. Um, and, and you go, and you got to know that you have a connection with God and that he's willing to help you. And your faith, your faith will help you to stop that foolishness, and then you have to do something about it. I have to reach to that radio and turn it off. And you got yourself a victory. That's sanctification. How did you get it, Mario? You get it through imparted righteousness. You come down and you sit at that table and you have prepared a great meal for that husband of yours. And you lovingly, and you know, you're going to be so sweet and prepare everything. And you get it all together and you sit down with a smile on your face and you say, how was your day, honey? And the brother don't say a word. And your mouth is tight. And something in you just want to tell him something. Sister, don't get this courage. You are a human. What are you going to do? Pray. Lord, help me not to lose my temple with this man. And here comes another victory. Amen? All day long, victory after victory after victory. Right? Amen? You don't, if you don't learn how to pray, you are not going to live right. There's the cutest restaurant in the city of Cincinnati, Ohio. And it just has a tiny room and a counter with eight stools. How many stools? And just above the counter, a sign that says, we can feed 8,888 people. And underneath it says, eight at a time. Hear the analogy. When you make your decision, in fact, Maggie, you and I, Maggie, when you make that decision today, follow the Lord, don't go worry about what you're going to be doing tomorrow in the next two years. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. You got that? And in the Holy Spirit series, we said that you got to ask for the Holy Spirit how long? How? Daily. Wake up in the morning and say, Lord, thank you for a new day. Keep me today. Don't be worrying about the next month. One day at a time. You worry about two months, you get discouraged. One day at a time. If he keeps you for one day, he's going to keep you for two. If he keeps you for two, he's going to keep you for a week. If he keeps you for a week, he's going to keep you for a month. You get it? He, he can keep you for the rest of your life one day at a time. 
Now, if you make a mistake and you stumble and fall, don't stay on the ground. Say, Lord, have mercy. Forgive me and try me one more time. And the Lord will wash away your sins and start you over again. He says, if any man sins, he has an advocate with the Father. Let him go boldly before the throne of grace and he will find mercy. What kind of mercy? Imputed righteousness to cover that mistake. And then imparted righteousness to get you going again. Amen? I said last week, one sin, how many? Can keep you out of the kingdom. You have to give it up. How do I know that? Hebrews 12, 1, it says, and let us lay aside any weight and the sin. Definitive, definitive article, the, which so easily ensnare us. So don't make excuses for yourself. All of these character flaws. Some of you think that I'm too direct. I'm too rough sometimes. Friends, ask my wife and she can tell you how the Lord has changed me. Oh, it has fashioned me. This is nothing. No, no, no. He, he continues to mold me to the man that he wants me to be. You see, I don't explode how I used to. I don't explode at work how I used to. I don't explode at church, even though sometimes I may want to. Because there's something within me that holdeth my rage. Something within me that I cannot explain. All I know that there's something within me. But you got to be born again. Nicodemus said, Lord, how does that work? How, uh, what do you mean? Lisa says, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man born of, of, of the water and of the spirit. It's not just, you know, getting baptized. You have to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But when you're washed, you're washed within the blood of the Lamb. And when you're baptized, Jesus considers that your new birth. And then you become the child of God. Christ comes down here. Christ came down here, excuse me, to work it out and to reconcile sinners to God. And when you believe and when you confess and when you make that commitment, Jesus will blot out all of your sins. And he will give you credit for his own good life. The problem is that some folks don't want to give up sin. And that was the problem with my friend. They don't want victory. They got the precious little sins that they love. They don't expect to give them up. They walk in the fence. They want to hold one hand to the world and one hand to the church. It cannot happen. Folks, it cannot happen. There's only two ways. The way of light and the way of darkness. So I stepped into that room, and I said to my friend, I know your night terrors are not letting you sleep for the past 17 years. And now he's using meth to stay awake. I spent one hour with him. And I read to him the whole sermon. And I said to him, I'm not asking you to join my church. I'm just asking you to accept Jesus. And I can guarantee you that the same way that he took my night terrors, he can take yours. I prayed for him. I lay hands on him. The nurse was sitting there. You're not allowed to do that in a psych ward. But I believe that the Holy Spirit was there with us. And I said this prayer. Father, I present to you my friend Javier. He needs you now more than ever. And I need you, Lord, to do something for him right now. Can you let him sleep tonight? Unbeknown to me, the very next day as I was flying back, I get a text on my plane in the, when I was in the plane. And it says, Javier is going to be released today. And we was released. I was talking to him, 
I said, how are you feeling today? I said, Mario, you're not going to believe it. I slept 10 hours last time. And I said, did they give you something? He's like, no. I just went to sleep. Folks, this is the way that God wants us to live. Confess your sins. He'll take care of your past. It's gone. Don't even think about it anymore. Because where it really counts... The only thing that is there is blood on your pages. But then every day that you struggle, every day that you actually just are challenged and tempted, say, Lord, help me. Help me. And he will give you that imparted righteousness. And every day you live by little victories one at a time. And that's how you become sanctified. It's no trick. It's no gimme. Jesus has actually done it. All you got to do is believe that he can do it for you and you alone. Claim it. And you can live right from today on. No matter what happens, no matter what is going on, I got out of that plane and when I called them, he said, your prayer Tell something in your prayer. I said, I believed in my prayer. And I believed that Jesus was there. Do you believe in Jesus now? He said, Mario, keep praying for me. In fact, let's pray every day. Let's pray together every day. That same day, a man, rough as it can be, still swearing, still smoking, still probably just going to drink some time. But he asked for prayer every day. And guess what? I'm going to do it. Because I cannot do it. I cannot. God is going to do it. God is going to do it because you know why? The very next day, that rough man call his mother, his ex-wife, his daughter, and said, I'm sorry for what I have done. I'm sorry. Repentance. It's confessing. All I need now is just a little bit more time for conversion. But he can do the same thing for every single one of us. Do you believe Jesus this morning? Yes. Do you believe him? Yes. If you want to be in his kingdom, if you want his imputed righteousness to take care of your past, but you also want his imparted righteousness to take you from here to heaven, every day living in victory, stand to your feet. Maybe someone here needs a first start. You need the blood of Jesus. Yeah, I cut that sermon short. I did that. You need a new start. Maybe you have gone on the wayside and now is the time to begin again with Christ. And Jesus brought you here. Jesus is saying to you right now, you know what? We can have a fresh start. All you need to do right now is say, Lord, I want that imputed righteousness. But I also need help from this point forward. If that is you, let's raise our hands unto the Lord. And say, Lord, here I am. Father in heaven, you see our hands. Father, we're saying with our lift up hands and mine is included. Lord, we need you. Forgive us for our sins, for our unrighteousness. And we believe that you have taken care of the past right here, right now. But Father, the future does not look good. 
But right now, right here, your imparted righteousness can be declared. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us make it into your kingdom. We want to be there. And we need the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, every day. So we're declaring right here to the entire universe, I will not let you go. I'm going to stick it up with God no matter what happens. You see our hands, Lord. You see it. Grab them because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And we want it, Lord. We want it right now. Thank you, Jesus, for answering this prayer. Thank you for being with us as we go through the rest of the program. And thank you, Father, for being with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated.